Good evening, everyone. My name is Bruce Baer, Dean of the College of Forest Resources. On behalf of the college, I wish to welcome all of you to this three-part lecture series entitled Sustaining Our Northwest World. Our intent in this series is to highlight the dynamic balance we seek in meeting the growing natural resources needs of society while sustaining the environmental, economic, and cultural values we associate with our urban and wildland resources. This set of lectures is a companion to the college's Denman Forestry Issue Series, also seen on UWTV and the Research Channel. Both series contribute to the college's vision of world-class leadership in sustaining natural resources and environmental services, and both help prompts healthy scholarly debate in our college and throughout the region on ways to improve the lives of future generations while satisfying the needs of people today. In our college, we study and investigate the sustainability and functionality of complex natural resources and environmental systems in both natural and managed environments using an interdisciplinary approach across multiple spatial and temporal scales to include our urban, suburban, and wildland landscapes. We focus on programs in sustainable forestry, sustainable urban ecosystems, and sustainable forest enterprises. Most natural resource decisions are complex, and many are contentious. Good solutions require that objective science be used to weigh the ecological, social, and economic consequences of decisions in order to meet the desired balanced result. All three values must be considered to achieve sustainability and to ensure the proper stewardship of our resources. The concept of sustaining our Northwest world is deeply rooted in the history of our college. Our newly transformed undergraduate curricula honor this tradition while simultaneously capitalizing on the competitive advantages we offer through our location in a major research university. We intend to produce the next generation of natural resource scientists, managers, and leaders who, along with you and other citizens, will ultimately be charged with sustaining a healthy Northwest environment, a dynamic Northwest economy, and the rich social and cultural heritage we all enjoy. Our college has long been recognized as a leader in forestry education and research, and as an integral part of the research enterprise of the university. We intend to build on these strengths by placing renewed emphasis on professional graduate education and research in areas of high impact to society. The ultimate goal is to ensure that our natural resources and environmental systems are sustained into the future. We are pleased to present this lecture series as a partnership between the University of Washington Alumni Association and the College of Forest Resources. We are also grateful for the support of the Rachel A. Woods Endowment, which is underwriting a portion of this series, and to the members of the college's Dean's Club for their unflagging support. Lastly, we are grateful for alumni activities with the college and encourage you to join the Alumni Association if you seek further involvement and want to stay connected. The speaker for today's lecture is Professor Jerry Franklin, Professor of Ecosystem Science in the College of Forest Resources. He is also the director of the Wind River Canopy Crane Research Facility at Carson, Washington. He has published numerous research papers and books and has received many awards, including the William B. Greeley Award from the American Forest Association and the Barrington Moore Award for Outstanding Achievement in Forest Research from the Society of American Foresters. He has been actively involved in the development of federal forest land policy for many years and was a member of the Federal Ecosystems Management Assessment Team. Now, what I'd really like to be talking with you about, just in terms of what I have great enthusiasm for, is about the forest science, uh, the science, scientific information that we've been developing over the last, really, three and a half decades. And it's really very incredible 
how much we've learned about forest ecosystems and how they work. And you know, much of it is so obvious in retrospect, I'm always a little embarrassed when I talk to an audience, even talking to my classes, that you know, I talk about these great things we've discovered, and it's sort of like talking to people about how, oh, I discovered water runs downhill, you know? And you know, the great lesson for me was this, these logs lying on the forest floor, and how I could have spent 20 or 25 years of my professional career thinking of them as waste, fire hazards, impediment to travel, and not occurring to me that something of that magnitude might have an ecological function or two. And so, literally, we continue today to discover all kinds of logs, things that are out there, they're obvious, but not until you recognize them uh, for what they are. So some of the things you know, we could talk about is, is, is the incredible way in which our mature and old forests have of capturing snow and mitigating impacts of potential rain on snow flood events. Could talk about how dramatically different the architecture of an old growth forest canopy is from that you know, classical, it's up there, planter surface umbrella kind of, of young forest canopy, completely different. And about the way in which our forests are so productive and so capable of capturing and storing so much carbon. And uh, some of the new technologies, absolutely marvelous. One of them that I really uh, am enthusiastic about is the LIDAR. Uh, remote sensing capability, uh, which stands for light detection and ranging. It's basically a laser sensing system that has capabilities we've never had before. And of course, a lot of contributions that have come as a result of the canopy crane down at Wind River, which have allowed scientists to get into that upper canopy of an old growth forest on a regular basis with heavy equipment and whatever kinds of gas bottles they needed to measure their various kinds of processes. Uh, and, of course, I might also talk with you about how we really need some very significant investments in infrastructure to allow us to continue to develop the science of these forest systems. Another topic would be fun to talk with you about is disturbances and, you know, the incredible things that we've learned about them and, for heaven's sakes, why did we have to have a Mount St. Helens eruption to learn about things like biological legacies, the importance of surviving organisms and structures uh, that persist following these disturbance events, which we think of as catastrophes, but really aren't catastrophes at all. Uh, so those are the kinds of things that I'd like to be talking to you about today. Uh, because, you know, that's... Uh, kind of uh, the, the thing that brought me into forestry in the first place. And you know, I went into forestry with the whole notion that I didn't have to deal with people. <laughs> I could go out in the woods and I could smell and I could hear and I could observe and I wouldn't have to participate in this extremely chaotic society that we human beings have. So what have I come to? I mean, here I am telling my students forestry is a social science, or at least at its root, it's a social science. And why do I tell them that? Because we live on a planet dominated by human beings. And for better, for worse, with intent or not, humans make all the important decisions about forests and what we do with them. Consequently, if you care about the forest, you damn well better be a social scientist because you're going to have to influence that human society. So I'm going to talk to you about what I view as a very important economic and societal challenge, that of maintaining the forest here in North America, maintaining the forest cover and the functional capabilities during the 21st century because I think we have a real challenge on our hand. And, uh, so that's what I'm going to talk with you about tonight. Basically, the consequences of globalization.
what I sometimes refer to as the invisible 600-pound gorilla that's really driving a great deal of the change that's occurring. I did refer to the fork in the road. I liked the idea, and I kind of thought when I started out, I might just devote the whole lecture to the fork in the forestry road. And, you know, I don't know that Yogi Berra ever said anything of the sort, but, you know, if you come to a fork in the road, you should take it. Uh, and uh, we certainly are. Uh, and certainly forestry uh, has always been characterized by a tremendous tension in terms of the way that forests are viewed, the way that forests are valued, and consequently the way that forests are managed. And I mean, great horny toads, it goes all the way back to Europe and what must have been the tension between the gamekeepers and the foresters. Uh, and certainly it's part of our history in the United States, uh, the debates of Gifford Pinchot and Muir with regards to what should happen to our forest resources. So we have a long history of tension. And foresters have struggled mightily through the last century to try to keep it all together, to try to present it as though there is a body of knowledge and a body of approaches here that can encompass all these diverging goals and objectives. But it's simply not possible any longer. Very clearly, forestry, forest stewardship is taking two pathways. One is a production pathway in which following capitalist principles, we uh, focus very intensively on wood production. The other is a more naturalistic stewardship kind of ecological forestry, where in fact, maintenance of the ecosystem in its complexity is a primary goal. And wood may or may not be an outcome from that, but ecosystem integrity very clearly is. And what is clear to me at this point is that some of us are going to take, society is going to take one of the forks in the road, that of production forestry. What I'm not clear about is whether or not we are going to, as a society, move actively down the road that I've called ecological forestry. And I'll come back to that at the end. Again, it's very clear to me uh, that we are going to take that production pathway. And we can see that happening very clearly uh, in uh, a lot of countries. And it involves uh, various uh, kinds of intensification. And in fact, the kind of model that you could think of for this might be, uh, you know, the agribusiness model. Another example of it that's perhaps close to us here at home is the shift from uh, uh, capturing wild salmon, basing uh, our, our salmon fisheries on what you catch as opposed to what you raise in intensively managed fish farms. And I want to talk about that globalization of the wood products industry and the challenges that it presents with regards to our own force here in North America and some possible societal responses to those challenges. So that's, that's basically what I'm going to be talking about for the rest of the lecture. Now, globalization uh, is basically just, uh, in many senses, the ultimate representation of capitalism unfettered. And what we see here is that uh, in these resource-oriented businesses, what happens as uh, capitalism is allowed uh, to basically operate. You get intensification uh, of the uh, management activity, and you get concentration of the industry itself. Uh, the little ones get eaten by the big ones and so forth. And again, you can think of the agribusiness model. One of the features here is that uh, in the kind of unregulated or deregulated capitalist system that we had under Reagan, basically uh, capital was free to find the most productive combination of land, of labor, of social structure, and move there. And of course, uh, you do have to bear in mind, if you want to remain in the business of growing wood products and producing wood products, 
And if you are a publicly held corporation, your goal is not basically to produce wood. Your goal, in fact, is to produce an acceptable rate of return on the invested dollar. And consistent with that, what you're probably going to do is to try to find the place where you can have the lowest per unit cost of production, all things considered. That's where you're going to go with this. And with globalization, with the development of the global marketplace and the free flow of capital throughout the world, basically the capital can not only move throughout North America, throughout the United States, but is free to move anywhere uh, where it's appropriate, where it can be more competitive, wherever that is in the world. And I may not like it, but that is the way our system works. And so it turns out that, in fact, uh, we have some extraordinary opportunities when it comes to growing wood. Uh, for the most part, uh, these involve intensively managed short rotation plantations of exotic species in, in the southern hemisphere. And over the last 50 years, as a result of a variety of efforts, of experimentation, of trial, of investment, basically it's become very clear that exotic plantations, typically of, of uh, North American pine trees and Australian eucalyptus trees, can grow at extraordinarily fast rates. Uh, radiata pine is particularly characteristic of these efforts. This is really, we know it as Monterey pine. Have you ever seen Monterey pine? It's, it's a derelict species in its native habitat. I mean, it's ugly. Well, it's picturesque, sorry. It's picturesque. But take it down to New Zealand, take it down to Chile, and you have something extraordinary. And there are other pines uh, that will do that same sort of thing. Loblolly pine will do it in some areas. Ponderosa pine along the steppe fringes in Argentina is extraordinary. In any case, it turns out that the concept of fiber farming, because you are following an agronomic model, not a forestry model, fiber farming with exotic species in the southern hemisphere is one heck of a place to grow wood. And these kinds of systems have incredible growth rates. There's a, 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 a wide availability of land uh, for growing this wood. A lot of it is abandoned grazing and agricultural land. Uh, and uh, you have relatively low, compared to us, labor and other kinds of social costs associated with it. Now, the development of these fiber farms are primarily in developed educated temperate zone countries. New Zealand, Australia, Chile, Argentina, Uruguay, subtropical Brazil. Subtropical Brazil, not tropical Brazil. Now note uh, that uh, these kinds of plantations uh, are not in the tropical regions. They are in temperate regions and occasionally subtropical regions. And explicitly, you need to realize that by growing our wood fiber crops there and exporting it, and exporting it to the United States, uh, we are not exporting our demand to tropical third world countries that have no kind of environmental uh, sensitivity. I think the New Zealanders, the Australians, the Chileans would object very strongly to such a presentation of, of their countries. So that basically this does not mean uh, exporting uh, our wood production and our wood demands to those kinds of places. In fact, if you look at the tropics, deforestation in the tropics is driven primarily by the objective of clearing land for agriculture and grazing purposes. And to the degree tropical wood is utilized as wood products, 85% of it is utilized in the tropical countries in which it's cut. And very little of it actually goes into world trade. 
And most of that is acquired, incidentally, by what I call environmental rogue countries, in the sense countries that don't care where their wood comes from, and that's countries like Japan, China, Taiwan, and the Koreas. So, this is not about exporting demand to tropical third world countries. Another thing that I often hear my forestry friends say, and, and I'm really sympathetic to this, is, you know, great horny toads, we have all this wonderful forest land, we need to be managing it. And we've got a lot of forest stock out there, why aren't we using that? You know, why aren't we cutting timber on the federal lands? It's immoral to be exporting our, our wood demands to other countries. I can empathize, but all I can say is that's the way the capitalist system works. And you can think of any other broad range of products that we could produce here just as well or better, but we don't because that's not the way a globalized capital marketplace works. So, what we see then in consequence is that uh, basically uh, we have extensive development of fiber farming in the southern temperate regions. And the productivity of these plantations can match the very best of our sites here in the United States. We can just barely compete with their productivity on our best forest sites here in the Northwest, and even the pineries of the Southeast cannot compete, uh, particularly when you add in labor and other kinds of social costs, along with the fact that their productivity is fundamentally no better than these fiber farms are. Consequence of that, timber production, wood production is headed south. Uh, that's pretty clear. And furthermore, the world is really awash in wood fiber. And I just don't know if you have any appreciation at all at this point of how much wood is out there and how difficult it is to market it in the global marketplace, particularly common wood fiber, poorer quality material, smaller size material. And there's no indication that this is going to change any time in the next several decades. So, it, this is important to think about because basically a lot of forestry was driven during the 20th century by the notion and the actuality of a timber scarcity. And if you look at the real dollar increase in stumpage value over the 20th century, it increased regularly throughout the 20th century, indicating that in fact there was a scarcity. There isn't a scarcity anymore, and it doesn't look like there's going to be one anytime soon. And we see tremendous investment occurring by corporate, publicly held corporations in plantations and in production facilities in the Southern Hemisphere. And, you know, just go to the Seattle Times last June, long article about Warehouser Company. What has Warehouser Company done in the last year? They've sold 250,000 acres of their forest land here in western Washington. They've also sold several hundred thousand acres, well, I won't say how many, they've sold a significant acreage of their southeastern acreage in Tennessee. And they have a billion dollar project to establish plantations and processing facilities using loblolly pine and eucalypts in Uruguay. Now you got any idea of where they're putting their capital? That should give you some idea where they're putting their capital. And they aren't putting it in to investments here in the Pacific Northwest. Willamette Industries, uh, that was a classic example of capturing a company that had been conservative in its management and had a lot of timber that could, in fact, be liquidated, which is exactly what Warehouser is doing. So. Large investments. This is incidentally a trend that was identified uh, some time ago. The first time I read about it was in this, this book, Logging the Globe by Pat Marshak, in which she 
begin to develop uh, a lot of these ideas about the movement of the industry and the consequences for the places uh, which were being left behind. Places uh, like some of our towns here in the Pacific Northwest. Places like some of the mountain villages in Japan. There are transitional strategies, but nevertheless, the movement is clear. Okay, so what? A lot of people would say, this is a good thing. What are you complaining about, Jerry, for Pete's sake? You know, now the timber industry is going to go away, and we can have the force, and we don't have to fight off those, those, those timber beasts anymore. Lots of folks believe we can resolve those forestry conflicts. In fact, by doing this, by going to intensive management, fiber farming, particularly in some of these far off locations. And in fact, it's, you know, really, neither a lot of the environmental organizations nor the timber corporations really wanted to resolve their differences in any kind of an integrated fashion. I mean, their, their goals were too different, their culture was too different. The notion of having to, to relate to each other in perpetuity was just too painful for words. <laughs> so, but why do we care? Why does it matter? Because it leaves us with a couple of great big problems here in North America and here in the Pacific Northwest. If, in fact, in large measure, or totally, the timber industry goes away, then how are we going to keep our forest land in some kind of functional forest cover? And secondly, where we own the land, such as the federal forest land, how are we going to carry out essential stewardship on that land? Because it turns out that that economic value that was associated with wood production was extremely valuable in clarifying for society that there were significant values there that needed to be taken care of and managed and protected, and that's going away. So, let's start with that first one, keeping private forest land in forest cover. Now, in Washington State, 40% of the forest land, 8,500,000 acres is privately held, almost equally by large corporations and by small, what we call non-industrial private forest land owners, people that own just a few hundred acres or even maybe just a few thousand acres. And then another 10% of our forest land is state trust lands, which again have an economic uh, a driver associated with them. So here we've got half of our forest land that is either privately held or is uh, in a trust status. Now, one of the questions obviously is who is going to buy those corporate forest lands and what are they going to do with them when they get them? And then secondly, what are going to be the economic incentives that are going to get those small non-industrial private forest land owners to keep their forest land and to maintain it in a, in a functional forest cover? Those are two really big questions. And we have a big stake in the answer to it because there are a lot of incredible values, services, and goods that we get from those private forest lands. And the most important of them all, and you'll see this again and again in my presentation, is water. Probably the most important resource from a forest system is a well-regulated, high-quality supply of water. Our society depends on that. Well-regulated, high-quality supply of water. Well, that's one. We depend upon it for wildlife habitat, to maintain a variety of species, game and non-game species. So it's very important as wildlife habitat. And of course it's important simply as open space, space in which we can recreate, space in which uh, we can hunt, etc. So we have a lot of need 
to have those forest lands maintained in a forest cover. We have a big stake in it. And we can see what might happen, what is happening to a lot of forest land in the United States. Basically, uh, it's being converted. You'd a lot rather have uh, a managed forest, even with its clear cuts and occasional disruptions, than in fact to have those kinds of subdivisions uh, on those forest lands. And currently, we're losing in the United States what projected loss in the next 50 years is about 25 million acres of forest land, simply to urbanization. So it's an immense problem. It's a big issue for us. You know this is happening. I mean, you live in the Seattle metropolitan area. You know what's happening uh, to the forest and agricultural lands around the fringes, fringes of this metropolis. Incidentally, Oregon's not as much trouble in the short term on this as Washington is, because they have some really significant land use legislation that wouldn't allow a timber corporation to simply sell that land to a subdivider. We, we don't have that same kind of constraint here. Now we have some groups working on this uh, in the Puget Sound region, but the challenge is immense. And I'll come back to this. There's some great strategies such as the, the one that was developed by the Evergreen Foundation. Now the second big issue, besides keeping private forest lands intact and functional, is that of active management of the public lands, essential stewardship of the publicly held lands. And I would argue that active management is imperative on millions of acres of the public lands. And this is one of my major points. Now, one of them is that globalization is driving a lot of this. A second one is that active management is necessary on a lot of these public lands. Now, there tends to be a, 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 a tendency, you know, for people to think that this will just happen. But, you know, there's a real question about who is going to carry out the stewardship and where the hell are the dollars going to come from to do that? Uh, there's an awful lot of things that need to be done out there. And as I said, there tends to be a, a notion on the part of a lot of people, including a lot of environmentalist friends of mine, that if you just stop doing this, you stop the logging activity, you know that, that this forest is going to take care of itself. And in fact, uh, it's not. It doesn't work out that way for an awful lot of our forest land. Too many things have changed in the last hundred years. To think that you can allow nature just to do all of the recovery for you. Now, for example, one of the things that's changed is we have an awful lot of simplified forests and uh, degraded stream systems that simply uh, would take a very, very long time period to recover, longer than we would like. We have very altered landscapes, not just urban landscapes, but public landscapes, as a result of our activities over the last 50 years on those lands. We've got altered environmental conditions. And, you know, whether you believe in global climate change or not, it's irrelevant, in fact, uh, we do get uh, cycles in the environment. We clearly are getting changes in certain kinds of environmental conditions. And so, you know, we can't go back. Uh, we don't have the conditions that we had 100 years ago or 200 or 400 years ago. Uh, not to mention we have a hell of a lot more pests and pathogens to deal with. And on a lot of our western forests, we have an uncharacteristic an unsustainable accumulation of forest fuels. Now, these were forests that were traditionally maintained by frequent light to moderate intensity fire as park-like stands. And uh, in, what we did was we changed those. And incidentally, don't think it was just due to fire suppression. Don't kid yourself about that. We did a lot of things to those western pine forests and those western mixed conifer forests. We did suppress fire. 
but we also graze them and we log them. And guess what? We developed dense plantations on them because we wanted to grow wood fiber. But in any case, uh, we have a lot of acres out there where we have uncharacteristic fuel accumulations and the consequences are not going to be very good. And at this point, I'd simply say to you, just because you know, the Bush administration is proposing we need to do some fuel treatments out there doesn't mean it's a bad idea everywhere. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I can understand anything that the administration proposes an environmentalist is inclined to look at. A bit askance, you know, yeah, really? Uh, I think I know what you want to do. Uh, but in fact, one of the things I find with this administration is that when the media call me up, it's really tough because I can't just say, oh, that's, that's just baloney, totally in air, because there often is. In fact, there almost always is a kernel of reality in a program like the Healthy Forest Initiative. The problem is trying to keep them, of course, from taking it places that it shouldn't go. In any case, we do have this kind of potential. The forests have developed the potential for uncharacteristic stand replacement fires. And uh, it's going to take an awful lot of effort to try to restore these systems. And guess what? It isn't a one-shot proposition. That stewardship is going to have to be done in perpetuity because those doggone forests grow. And you can't use enough prescribed fire or natural fire to deal with the rate at which they grow. Again, you know, why should we care about those uncharacteristic fuel accumulations? Let nature deal with it. She'll deal with it. But the problem is we have incredible values at risk in those wild lands. We can't just deal with urban interfaces. We have at risk incredible watershed values. And again, now, I would argue that this is the most valuable product of a forest. We have elements of biodiversity that are risk out there. You know, there's a tremendous amount of California spotted owl habitat that's at risk of stand replacement fire. There's a lot of, of dry fringe northern spotted owl habitat that's at risk. And as far as I'm concerned, there's a lot of big old pine trees at risk out there and I'll be damned if I want to just stand by and watch those things burn up in uncharacteristic fire because I wasn't willing to go out there and pay the money and do the work and allow the process of dealing with those uncharacteristic fuel accumulations. Nature will correct our excesses or situations uh, that in fact have taken a different track we, maybe we don't want to grow wood anymore, but we won't like what she does. We won't like the outcome in terms of our societal values. It's been interesting for me to see that societies really don't like to support stewardship of their natural resource lands. And it's interesting that once, once an economic element goes away, the society seems to stand back and say, ah, ah, I don't want to spend any money. The forest will take care of itself. New Zealand is a great example of this. They set aside all of their forests, all of their native forests, and said, we'll just manage the radiata pine plantations. And they won't spend the money to even do basic management, monitoring, protection, stewardship of their native forests, which are undergoing dramatic impacts from exotic organisms. And again, I'll remind you, it's not a one-shot proposition. Stewardship is forever. In my view, getting social consensus for active management on the public lands is the most important thing that the senior agency personnel should be seeking uh, here in the United States. And you know, I've had dialogue with Dale Bosworth, Chief of the Forest Service on this, and I say, Dale, um, what you really need to do as an agency is develop trust. You know, you need 
to develop that trust with society so they will allow you to conduct the active management that's necessary. And you need to quit messing that up with statements about wood production and just take that away from the table so people can understand what this is really about. Dale doesn't agree with me. He says, if you just let me clean out some of the paperwork, it'll all be fine. I don't believe it, and neither do you. Okay. Responses to the challenges. Uh, as I work on this second paper on globalization, I'm trying to think of as many different ways that we might respond as a society to those two challenges. And remember what we're trying to do. We're trying to maintain uh, functional forest cover on our private forest lands and appropriate stewardship of our public forest lands. So how do we do that if, in fact, we lose the bulk of the incentive and the subsidy that goes with wood production? What are some of the approaches? One obvious one is simply to purchase the lands or to purchase co conservation easements on the land. And uh, obviously, we'd have to focus that on the critical lands. I mean, we're dealing with uh, 4 million acres of corporate forest lands just here in the state of Washington, not even considering the state of Oregon. We can't and wouldn't, as a public, probably acquire that. But nevertheless, land purchase by local, state, and federal governments, purchase of conservation easements, uh, land purchase by foundation and NGOs. And I was so sorry uh, that Evergreen Foundation was not able to get the uh, permission to sell the tax-free bonds in time to capture that 100,000 acres of warehouser lands uh, out uh, in the Snoqualmie drainage. Uh, another thing that we can think about are regional coalitions of governments, industry, NGOs, developing regional approaches, combining acquisition, agreements, uh, agreements to practice ecological forestry, uh, easements. And a lot of this has gone on in the Northeast. And one of the interesting things about the Northeastern United States is they have already gone through this, this matter of the corporations leaving. Now, basically, all of the big corporations sold their lands in the Northeast and moved out. And uh, one extraordinary project that's developed in northern New Hampshire and adjacent Maine is one involving a tremendous coalition of, of government, of private individuals, of NGOs that have developed, uh, a, in fact, a very comprehensive plan for how a subregion might be maintained in a functional forest cover. The Northeast has a lot to teach us, I think, about how to deal with these kinds of issues. Another thing we can do is begin to value or monetize more of the services and goods that we get from forests. I mean, as I think about trying to, to justify to society stewardship of their public lands or how we persuade private landowners to maintain forest cover, it's so obvious to me that some way they have to be compensated or we have to recognize the values that go with the forest cover that we have taken for granted for so long. So that's obviously a very important approach that we can take. What are some of the values that we might begin to, to value in new ways, to maybe to monetize? Water. Man, if we paid per gallon of water for what it's worth, we would never think of anything else in managing a forest watershed. I worked in the Sierras. Water is gold in California. They don't pay for it. But if they did, that would be the prime directive for management of the Sierra National Forest. Production, pr protection of that high quality, well-regulated flow of water. Carbon sequestration. There is no forest in the world that can sequester carbon like our forests. I mean, the tropics can't hold a candle to us because they, you know, respire and decompose their stuff away. We don't. We store it in these great big monster trees that live for 
hundreds and thousands of years and then decay at the rate of hundreds of years. So we have forests that have an incredible capacity to store carbon. And in fact, we have an immense unfilled capacity for carbon storage in the forests of the Pacific Coast. Because through our logging activities, we have drawn down the carbon stocks in our forested landscapes. So if we had a carbon market, wow, we could, we could really get something out of that. And of course, uh, another example would be wildlife. The folks in the southeast, you know, have done a lot already with managing forest land for wildlife and being compensated for it. Hunting clubs is a way that they do it. And, and this is a kind of, of stand that they manage for that kind of thing, a longleaf pine stand. We could use all kinds of incentives and subsidies. We could use the tax structure to help maintain forest cover, to provide public goods. We could even think about making direct payments to private landowners. What if we paid people to provide habitat for a nesting pair of spotted owls or for a population of flying squirrels? Why wouldn't we do that? Why do we expect them to do it for free? So, uh, another th thing we could do, we, sh we, we could do to help in terms of dealing with these kinds of issues is make a better effort to try to maintain an indigenous forest products industry. And you know, the example for me was down in the, the Rogue River Valley, and I was sitting there at a, a meeting of stakeholders talking about the national forest, the Rogue River and the Siskiyou National Forest. And they'd been at it for three days, you know, the classic stakeholder uh, tensions the timber guys and the enviro guys and the fire guys and the wildlife guys, gals too, pardon me. Uh, so, and at the end of this conference, you know, I, they asked me to make a comment. And I got up and I said, you know, you people are addressing the wrong issues. Uh, you know, 21st century isn't about timber versus environmental value. Uh, basically, your processing capability in the Rogue River Valley is going to be gone within a decade. And you're going to be sorry that they're gone because you won't have uh, that capacity any longer, that skilled workforce, that place that can provide you with some economic subsidy for your stewardship activities because your issues are going to be fire and watershed protection and wildlife habitat. That's what your issues are going to be. And you're going to be sorry when they're gone. So that's one thing to think about, doing things that help maintain an indigenous industry. Another thing that may relate to helping to maintain an indigenous industry and maybe a regional market might have to do with certification. It may have a role uh, in terms of identifying a particular uh, 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 type of, of forest production and it might be very valuable as a way of limiting access to regional or even national markets. Now there's going to be a problem with this because under World Trade Organization they're going to say this is an unfair impediment uh, to open commerce but nevertheless uh, we may be able to either develop or is to maintain some regional and national markets by doing things like using processes of certification. The real value of certification is, in fact, the access that it potentially gives you to marketplaces. So anyway, that might be one way of doing it. And we do need to be thinking about creating and maintaining niche markets uh, at, the, at the level of international trade. And one of the things that we do have is we do have a lot of, of high quality woods. Uh, I often hear my forestry fans say, well, you know, yeah, they can grow that bulk fiber, but we've got dug fir and red cedar and all those good things. I just want to warn you, they can grow those too. And what our real niche is, 
is the kind of wood that you can't grow in intensively managed plantations. Okay, that's, that's where the real niche is going to be. Slow grown material, woods that can't be grown, trees that can't be grown in that kind of environment. Okay, we do have a problem incidentally, and this relates again to processing capability, that we simply do not have any markets anymore for this low quality material particularly the sort of thing that we're dealing when we're trying to restore structural complexity in our plantations and when we're trying to deal with fuels in fire-prone forests. Now, this material is a real problem, and one of the things we may have to think about, hide your head, subsidies to processors and long-term contracts to guarantee specific amounts of wood fiber. Now, whoa, I mean, we just got out of those long-term contracts in Alaska. What are you talking about? Well, the reality is, if we're going to get people to build uh, the facilities, the biomass plants, etc., that can handle large quantities of low-value low material, they're going to have to have some guarantee that there's going to be a wood supply for that facility for the next 10 years or the next 20 years. And one of the interesting things that was in the Healthy Forest Initiative was, in fact, the notion of subsidizing the development of biomass processing capabilities. And I think it was a very good part of it. Another thing, and again, an anathema to many environmentalists, we have to begin to think about turning over more of the stewardship responsibilities to local groups. Oh, oh, I know people are saying, how could he say that? But in fact, who better to take stewardship responsibilities than the people most directly affected by the resource? And I give you the example of the Cedar River watershed, where the municipality of Seattle t has taken over responsibility for management of the entire watershed. It so happened that they acquired ownership of it, but it would have been appropriate whether they had or not. And we can think about that with regards to stewardship and fire-prone forests. You know, city of Ashland, for example, any of you that know it, uh, a disaster waiting to happen. Who better to deal with stewardship issues? So I think we have to begin to think about that. More local responsibility for stewardship. Okay, to sort of conclude then this whirlwind assessment, of the challenges created by the globalization of the wood products industry. Globalization is happening, and it is creating major changes in our ability to sustain our forest landscapes and carry out forest stewardship. And if we don't attend to it, this is the kind of, of urbanization that we can expect in a lot of our forested landscapes. Retaining forest cover is going to be essential uh, in order to sustain the goods and services that we want. An active management of many public and private forest lands is imperative. Now there were a couple of other challenges that I could have considered dealing with tonight. Big challenges that we're going to have to deal with in the 21st century. And I picked globalization because there's no question about it. It's happening, you can see it, you're being affected by it, okay? So, and it's been largely an invisible force, despite the power that it brings. There are a couple of other really big ones that you're gonna have to deal with. And one of those, of course, is global climate change. And it's going to be most profoundly affecting us in terms of the effect on disturbances, I think. You know, established forests have a tremendous resilience. They have a t capacity to absorb a lot of climatic change and continue. But we're going to see altered disturbance regimes, fires, storms, insect and disease outbreaks. And then, of course, my favorite, I don't have a, a picture of it, but exotic pests and pathogens. 
And uh, I tell my students that this is probably the greatest danger to the forests of the Pacific Northwest, and in fact, the forests on the North American continent. And I have to say, the whole notion of moving raw wood or unprocessed wood products between the continents, let alone green plants, is insane. It is Russian roulette, indeed. And yet we do that. We do that, and we consider it to be an essential part of free trade. But there is an organism out there that is the Douglas fir equivalent of the chestnut blight. And when it gets here, the consequences are going to be catastrophic. And I would argue that the notion of the movement of exotic pests and pathogens between continents is something it's, in, it's not in the interest of any continent to allow that kind of exchange or trade to occur. Uh, but, so if we didn't have enough issues to deal with already, we've got a couple of real, real winners. Uh, the responses to all of these challenges have common elements, and they include active and sustained management, of our private and our public forest lands. And uh, they involve entering an era when sustained and informed collaboration between the human species and the forest ecosystem is imperative for the good of both. A sustained and informed collaboration, active management, participation if we're going to sustain the goods and services that we want from these systems. Well, that's just a picture of me back in the forest again, where I'd really kind of prefer to be, but... So, that's my version of the sky is falling and what we might do about it. The 21st century will not be a replay of the timber environmental wars of the 20th century. It's time to put those old playbooks behind us, see clearly the challenges we face, and develop new approaches, reconsider old solutions, and develop new ones. Thank you.